There we go. I'm just getting used to this gyroscopic mouse. I haven't used this thing yet. This is pretty cool, though. Look at that. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how to use ultrasound to to pick up a DVT, and um, I, you know, we use ultrasound for uh, lots of things in the emergency department. Some things are very difficult, like um, appendicitis has probably got the most operator dependency of any ultrasound modality. I would say it's up there with the gallbladder is really tough, cardiac stuff. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like um, doing procedure guidance, which is really straightforward, I think. Um, the aorta is uh, pretty straightforward. It's a very single vessel. You know, how do you screw that up? And this is one of the other ones over there um, that I find that people pick up readily. I, you know, I've been teaching this stuff around the country to attending physicians already working for, you know, 20 years in practice. And, and they all struggle with the gallbladder, um, but they all are amazed at how straightforward this DVT stuff is. So this is something I know we do lots of rely on our scans for a lot of other stuff that's harder than this, but I find that this is where we end up getting a lot of, you know, formal ultrasounds uh, to just to be safe, I think. Because um, it is a high stakes game. If you miss a gallstone, it's not that big of a deal. But if you miss a blood clot in somebody's leg and it goes to the lung and kills them, that is a big deal. So I can see why there is some trepidation here. That being said, I think uh, so far we haven't had any problems doing this now for about six or seven years, um, almost a thousand studies. And so, um, so I think it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Um, so how do you do it? Well, it's actually, um, it's, actually it's, pr it's pretty straightforward. What you're going to do is you're going to take this, uh, this linear probe. And the linear probe, it's got this flat uh, area to it. And anytime we can get away with using a linear probe, we will. Because it's high frequency, it makes beautiful images because of its high frequency uh, bandwidth. And it's got you know, best resolution. Um, now, if you notice that there is, a, there is a bandwidth to it from 5 to 10 megahertz, and, um, and that's something to kind of think about because um, at the 10 megahertz range, it's really for very superficial structures. And some of these patients who've got large legs, um, you want to turn it down to the, uh, to the 5 megahertz setting or what we call the penetration mode. And you do that on the mode setting on the Sonosite device. You would go from gen to res to pen. And uh, you, it just toggles. So you keep pushing that button, and it keeps going back between gen, res, and pen. What does that mean? Gen means the middle frequency setting. So if the probe goes from 5 to 10 megahertz, Generally speaking, it'll fire up at that middle frequency general setting at 7.5 megahertz. On patients who have very large tree trunk legs, you want to turn it down to the penetration mode so you can get the sound to go all the way towards the end of its ability to see, which in a linear transducer is about 5 or 6 centimeters on the penetration mode because you're down at about 5 megahertz then. Okay, so we had a patient the other day who was really challenging to see enormous legs uh, that I had over an ED3. And we did, we went to the penetration mode, and we actually got um, some decent images of our femoral system. The popliteal system was a, was a, was a loss. <laughs> so in those extreme edges of, of body habitus, I think it's reasonable definitely to send those patients downstairs to radiology. Now, uh, ultrasound really is the initial screening modality um, in symptomatic patients. So to think that you can go bed to bed to bed um, you know, in patients who are just at risk for DVT like they are in the ICU, but not necessarily with symptoms, the same test characteristics don't necessarily hold up. So it's really great in the symptomatic patient. There's about a half million screen exams every year. We know that ultrasound is, is accurate. It's 95% sensitive, 98% specific in those symptomatic patients. And when you withhold anticoagulation in those patients, it's been shown to be safe. Now, the problem is that in their own literature, radiology has been whining about the overuse of, uh, of the emergency department or the, um, of radiology because the majority of these scans, they're screening ultrasounds, and the majority of them are actually negative. And so, you know, taking the patient down to the, to the radiology department, finding a technician, interpretation, to do this 24 hours a day, not available across the country, definitely. I mean, we could do it here at UCI. But uh, we're definitely the exception and not the rule. Most places around the country, uh, because this is so burdensome on the Departments of Radiology, and I use that term because I found it in their own literature, uh, in a journal that they had published this, they used that term that the ER is burdensome on them. Um, I loved it. I jumped right on that and throw it in my lectures whenever I can. Uh, basically, <clears throat> for um, uh, around the country, it really is too much to ask somebody to be on call 24 hours a day to rule these out. So what do they do? You got someone with leg swelling in an emergency department, you don't have ultrasound, you know what you do? 
you give them Lovenox, and they, they get another ultrasound the next day. Lovenox, as we all know, is not a benign drug. If you had to inject Lovenox to me right now, um, you know, based on my lifestyle, I wouldn't really like that at all, to be honest with you. There's some risks there with giving people Lovenox. It's much easier, I think, to just go into the ultrasound. So how do you do it? Well, um, just keep in mind, this is some anatomy over here. We've got the, um, the femoral area around this area here. And this is the inguinal ligament. And we can see right at that inguinal uh, ligament there, that's where the abdomen turns into the leg. And, um, and we can see these vessels that emerge along the leg there, the femoral artery and the femoral vein. And at this very proximal location, you're actually going to be able to see the great saphenous vein. If I can show you right there, that's the great saphenous vein adjoining the common femoral vein. And at that location, that's where you're going to start compressing. Okay, it's really up su su superior, okay? Way up there by, the, um, by, the, by that uh, inguinal ligament. Now, um, right away you're going to see a branching of the femoral vein into the superficial and deep femoral uh, veins. Um, and the deep femoral vein is a very small caliber structure. It's actually really hard to see. As soon as it dives right down to the bone, you don't even actually see it anymore. And so because it's small caliber and you can't see it, it's not that clinically relevant anyways if it got a DVT because it becomes such a small caliber. But you will see the common um, femoral artery bifurcate into its superficial and profundus arteries and those structures are very visible on ultrasound. And then you're going to march down the leg and you'll be able to see pretty much all this vasculature right along here and then about halfway down or so it dives into this adductor canal, maybe two-thirds of the way down. You get into this adductor canal very difficult to insinate this region right here. Um, it takes people, even in the best of hands, to be able to see this an additional 10 to 15 minutes um, total for both legs to be able to visualize the adductor canal. But then eventually it gets down into the popliteal fossa. So here it is up here in the, um, in the groin area. We see the superficial femoral artery, and we can see down here the deep femoral artery with its paired common femoral vein. You can see how they're linked side by side here, uh, lateral, medial. How do you remember that the, uh, the vein is more medial to the artery? Venus rhymes with penis. <laughs> vagina, does it rhyme with vagina? It starts with the same, I know that's how you remember it. So, yeah, whenever I'm teaching this at the bedside, I have to decide if I'm gonna say Venus penis or Venus vagina, but um, hopefully I get it right most of the time. But so. So which leg is this? Which leg do you think this is right here? If the indicator here is to the patient's right, is this the left leg or the right leg? Good, it's the left leg, as we're demonstrating here, adjacent in the picture. Excellent. Good. So, and that's kind of the course that uh, the, the vessel will take. Kind of this is where you're going to be placing the probe. This is the sonographic window. And then right when you get to about here, you're not going to be able to see the femoral vein very well at all because it dives down in that, that adductor canal. But eventually, though, it comes all the way down to this popliteal region where we make um, good visualization of it again. And in that popliteal region, what happens is that the vein comes to the top in the pop because now we're looking, oops, wait a minute, hold on, go back. Now we're looking um, more super, we're looking behind the knee. So this is the skin line back here. This is actually posterior, right, because we're looking behind the knee. The skin line is now posterior. And the first thing that we, the first anechoic, structure that we see in a transverse plane is going to be our popliteal vein, and the deeper, closer to the bone, will be the popliteal artery. And what happens is eventually that popliteal vein will sort of bifurcate and then ultimately trifurcate and quadfurcate on you, if that's a word. And that's kind of where you're looking. You're looking up here in the, in the superior aspect of the popliteal fossa down until you see, usually you see it bifurcate right at the top of the calf in that area there. And that's this basically five centimeter area that you're trying to, to compress. That's where you're looking. Now, notice here, what I'm doing here is I've got the knee flexed, and I've got the patient's hip externally rotated and the knee flexed. That's the ideal position to put these legs in when you do these popliteal uh, compression techniques. You could take your scan hand is on, the, is on the probe, and then your other hand I place on the knee. So I'm not doing it right here, but I should. I should have my, my so I scan with my right hand in these cases and I put my left hand over here on the patient's knee, and then I compress these two structures together. Now, sometimes you're looking back in the popliteal fossa, and you just don't see what you're looking for. You don't see the, the popliteal vascular system, and what probably because you're too lateral. You want to come more medial, more towards that biceps tendon, okay? 
and then you'll get to where that popliteal fossa, the popliteal vasculature is. It's kind of adjacent to uh, that tendon area. And what I do then is I just start punching stuff. I start compressing. As I'm compressing, what's happening is I'm starting to see blood vessels open up and close. So it's, it's really an active technique. If you just put the probe on there and stand there and stare at it, you may totally be in the wrong place. Number one, and number two, if you don't start compressing stuff, you may not be able to tell the difference between, you know, like some of the muscle bellies and nervous structures and vascular structures. It's hard to tell. But once you start moving the probe around, then you start, then the, the images start to jump off the screen at you. So this is um, this is what it looks like. This is a still image protocol, just to show you what we're looking at here. This is uh, what do you think SV stands for? Good saphenous vein. This is the the location right where it dumps into the common femoral vein. And it's just adjacent to the common femoral artery. So venous penis, which leg is this? Right leg, correct. This is without compression. And then down here, this is with compression. Notice this large muscle belly now has come up and uh, basically occluded the two venous structures. And we see the common femoral artery not getting occluded. So this is very proximal, because I see the saph coming in right there. Very proximal. That's the first spot that I would start my compression technique. And according to the ASEP criteria, you're going to walk five centimeters distally from this location. And if you do so, you're done. You move on to the popliteal system. We'll come back to that. I just wanted to give you that little preamble. Now, full compression. This is what it looks like in the femoral area. We're looking here. There's no clot. You see this? This thing is easily compressible. Um, here's the two paired arteries right here. And again, we're at that uh, right leg. Somebody was nice and labeled it for us. And we have nice full compression. You know you're pushing too hard if the artery starts to wink back at you because it's pulsating. So just enough pressure to get the veins to collapse. Good. Now we're going to move on to, the, to the, um, what it looks like when we have a clot. You can see now this structure here is not compressible. As the clip restarts. We can see over here, we can see that the, the femoral arterial kind of wink back at us. And then here's our clot. Now here's something to think about. Once you identify that somebody does have a clot in their, in their groin, this clip is just kind of looping itself. But I, but I don't do a lot of teaching at this moment. This is when I stop compressing and I say, okay, this patient's got a clot in their leg. At this point, I need to treat it. And any more perturbation here, it, it could, could dislodge the clot. Okay, so this is a situation where once I see a blood clot here, I really, I mean, you could tell this thing is not compressing. It's very obviously um, a clot. And this is where I want, want to start thinking about giving anti, anticoagulants and not getting formal radiology ultrasounds because that's only going to potentially dislodge this clot. I remember a patient, an older man, who was having pain in his leg, <coughs> and the family was using a massager because he was having pain, and all of a sudden he got very short of breath and had thrown the clot to his lungs. Interesting case. Yeah, the massager and the leg pain, the massager dislodging the clot, the patient gets pulmonary embolism. What's that thing uh, Langdorf always says? The uh, no good deed gone unpunished or something? I forgot how he says it, but that's the kind of the thing. Here, let's massage your groin for you. Next thing you know, you can't breathe. <laughs> hey yo. Now we're in the pop. <laughs> Are we credentialed as a faculty group to, to read these? Everybody, I believe, is credentialed except for two of the attendings. Everybody else is credentialed to interpret these. The two that are not, I'm uh, more than happy to meet with them and get them up to speed on this and get them credentialed. But uh, the other 10 of us are. So the answer to your question is yes. The answer is yes. Yes. Um, OK, now we're in the pop. And this is what a normal looks like. This is the popliteal artery down here. Here's the popliteal vein seen up here. And again, if you're just standing there staring at it, it might not make sense. You've got to get in there and dig around and compress it, and then you'll start to see the, the structures winking back at you or not. Um, if we move on to, the, um, to one that's a positive, now we can see here's that femoral artery. We're pushing kind of hard on it. It's, it's, it's pulsating. And this structure above it here, this is all the clot up here. So this whole structure here is the, I said femoral, I meant popliteal. This is all the popliteal vein up here. Remember, the vein comes to the top and the pop. Here's the popliteal vein, popliteal artery. This one's positive for a GBT. Now, the traditional technique, as I alluded to, involves starting up there at the inguinal canal and then marching all the way through that, um, all the way down until basically you reach the, the bifurcation of the popliteal vein through that adductor canal, okay? 
And it also involves, sometimes the adductor canal is called the superficial femoral canal. It also involves um, using a color flow technique, okay? And, um, and the other thing to think about as we go through this and trying to decide how to do this is, do we need to compress every single continuous millimeter or do we march every one centimeter? And the answer is, in symptomatic patients, since clots involve whole, whole or multiple venous segments, you can go every one centimeter in the fem and the pop. You don't have to go every single millimeter when you're doing your compressions. But um, the, the question still, still, though, in your mind is, can I skip this safely and move to the fem and the pop technique without getting in trouble by, by missing a clot that's isolated here to that superficial femoral canal or adductor canal, okay? And so there's been some literature out there to try to answer that question, limited versus complete technique for low extremity ultrasound. One study was done years ago in radiology they did a retrospective study with 146 cases, and they did find one patient who had an isolated superficial uh, femoral vein clot. And then they did a, uh, a prospective study involving only 56 patients, and they found that there was um, no evidence, no, no thrombus was missed by the limited exam. Then emergency physicians did this at Christ Hospital the year before I got there to do my fellowship. They took 112 patients, they had 34 DVTs, and they compared themselves to radiology, um, using radiology as a, uh, as a gold standard. The radiologists were doing a full leg color technique and uh, it turned out that, um, that they had pretty good agreement. There was one combative patient that the, that the ED called positive, radiology called negative, and there was another patient that the ED called positive. Radiology called negative, but the ED was so sure it was positive they ordered a contrast venogram that turned out to be positive. Um, so, although that did count against the statistics when they, they just looked at emergency ultrasound versus radiology ultrasound, unfortunately. But anyways, they were able to do these in about three and a half minutes, and the technique, the Doppler technique of augmentation was not helpful there with a DVT. And that's what all the literature shows, that the Doppler techniques, the color techniques, are unreliable uh, when it comes to their test characteristics. Tim Jang, who's now at UCLA, uh, during his uh, residency at Wash U, um, did this study looking at residents doing ultrasound and found that residents had sensitivities in the 100 percentile range, specificities in the 91 percentile range with 72 patients comparing themselves to radiology. But really the best study is this one right here. And uh, this study was um, multi-center, prospective, randomized, consecutive. It was involving um, 22 uh, authors because it was a, a multi-center study. And basically you fell into two groups. Either you were in a two-point ultrasound group um, with a negative D-dimer, um, or um, you were in a, uh, so either were in the, the two-point compression group with a D-dimer, or you were in the whole leg color ultrasound group. And so if you were in the two-point compression group, you either had a negative D-dimer or a positive D-dimer. If you had a negative D-dimer, you came back in three months. If you had a positive D-dimer, then you came back in a week. And then if that was, um, ultrasound was negative, then you went on to have a follow-up in three months. Uh, so all the patients in the two-point group got followed up at three months. Um, all the patients in the whole leg ultrasound group got followed up in three months. Now, what's interesting about the whole leg group is that they also included the caffeine. They marched their way all the way down through the caffeines, which they had a term for called axial um, uh, DVTs. So there were 2,098 patients that got randomized in each group. That's what I mean by this was a good study. They had 1,045 in the two-point group and 1,053 in the whole leg strategy. And essentially, at the end of the study, there was no difference between the groups. They had the exact same outcomes. And in the whole leg group, they were able to isolate um, 65 cases here of DVT, of, I should say, of um, caffeine. These are all caffeine DVTs, basically, right here. And they didn't treat these patients. They identified them. Um, and nothing happened to these patients. Uh, they came back in, um, in three, week, three months, and if they had pro a progression to a more proximal vein DVT, or if they had s worsening symptoms, they came back sooner, and then they got treated. But there was still no difference between the whole leg group that found the caffeines and the two-point group that did not find the caffeines. Either way, the patients all had the same outcomes, which is another piece, there's been a lot of it, but it's another piece of indirect evidence to suggest that we do not need to treat caffeine thromboses. So what about 
Doppler. Doppler or duplex is a term that means the simultaneous ability to look at grayscale ultrasound as well as superimposing color over it looking at the moving red blood cells, the Doppler shift in frequency of the moving red blood cells. And that term duplex is sort of an old school term and it means you know, both, seeing both these things at the same time, which nowadays every single ultrasound machine does, does duplex. It's sort of a leftover term. Yes, Dr. Schultz. Just back to that one previous slide. The, the study, did they look at um, what was their outcome, PEs? No, just uh, their outcome was, was DVT. Okay. Was DVT. So they weren't looking to see if there was, with the people with the clots in the calves, if they developed post-phlebitic syndrome or any other? They didn't look at any other morbidity factors for the, for the cathophlebitic syndrome, no. So it turns out that with this Doppler, this duplex technique, that um, it seems like it would be a great idea to be able to see problems with the actual flow of the blood through the vessels. However, when you look at the test characteristics of all the different Doppler or duplex techniques, none of them are good. And they are just not accurate enough to rely upon to say one way or the other patient does or does not have a DVT, which is good for us novice sonographers who just want to rely on the grayscale techniques alone and not have to learn these fancy color techniques. That's kind of where I'm, where I'm going with this. So if you look at any radiology textbook, you'll see that the color techniques have a lot of problems with their test characteristics, whereas the grayscale doesn't. So one of the techniques is augmentation. and um, and we can see here they've got the probe up here in the femoral region looking at the common femoral vein and they've got the squeezing of the calf down here okay and as you squeeze the calf here's that common femoral vein here there's a filling defect and this is a positive um, augmentation right now for a filling defect of the common femoral vein okay so that seems pretty cool like hey why can't we always do this but the pro and it and it does suggest when you when you when you have full color surrounding the entire vessel here that there is patency between the point of compression and the sampling site. However, once again, all the literature shows we cannot rely on this augmentation technique. It just doesn't work. There are other techniques too with Doppler like spontaneity. You should just see blood spontaneously flowing in the larger vessels without having to compress the calf. It doesn't work. Phasic variation, that as you breathe in and out, you should see changes in the Doppler signal, but again, it doesn't work. What about clot echogenicity? You'd think that you'd be able to just visualize the clot and say, oh, there's a clot. And you did see that a little bit on some of those examples I showed you. However, um, clot echogenicity is variable. It depends on the transducer that you're using, the frequency it's at, how old the clot is, what the extent of the thrombolytic process is. And um, sometimes if the blood is moving slow enough, and if you overgain it a little bit, what we used to call poor man's Doppler, we could actually hallucinate a clot there. So slow flowing blood with, that's overgained can look like can look echogenic. So you can't rely on this clot echogenicity thing. Here's another pitfall. You can get hung up on the biceps tendon. Um, uh, especially in, in really muscular individuals, these muscles back here are hard to compress and you think you're not able to compress the probe but it's just getting hung up on these muscles or that tendon back there and you say, oh I must have a clot here because I can't compress. Well maybe you need to get the patient to flex their leg a little bit, relax. Sometimes if you've got an assistant to help you, you, could, you, could, you can roll them um, prone and have somebody you know, tilt their leg up at 45 degrees, um, 60 degrees or so, and then you can get in there and do your compression um, to really take the uh, muscle tone off of there. Because any muscle tone at all back there can slow you down sometimes with your compression technique. And then a guy like this who's, um, you know, really large or really uncooperative or somebody who's covered in stool, these are the patients that we need to uh, refer, um, you know, because sometimes we just don't have enough horsepower in our machines, to our portable machines, to punch the sound all the way down to the, um, to the vasculature. Here's another problem here. This is when you get in the wrong vein. This is a, this is a classic one that somebody showed me. They said, oh, this is a negative DVT. Well, you know, it turns out this is not a deep vein. This is a calf vein right here or a muscle vein. This is superficial vein. Notice there's no paired arterial structure with it. It's just kind of all by itself over there. So you got to make sure you see the paired structures. And we've got this all the way down to four, a second ago this depth was at 4.6 centimeters and that, that's pretty deep. This person's probably got a really large leg so you might need to um, 
If you're having problems getting good visualization, send them down to radiology. So just to, con just to kind of ram this point home a little bit more, um, the primary diagnostic criterion to rule in or rule out a DVT is the non-compressibility of the grayscale. All this other stuff over here, they're all kind of adjuncts, but not reliable one way or the other to rule in or out a DVT. This is a table straight out of a radiology textbook. OK, so let's go around the room and see if we can answer these questions. Number one, uh, who's on ultrasound right now? Oh, it's uh, Art. Is he still? Yeah, Art, what do you think about this one? I know you just went through the ringer on the M&M case. But, uh, so this person came in, um, I'll tell you a little bit of history. They came in with um, calf pain and swelling, um, uh, especially in the popliteal areas. Really, the, the popliteal area, they're having the most discomfort. Young person, no real DVT risk factors, but just um, a lot of pain back there in the popliteal region. Uh, it doesn't look like not well demarcated. I don't think it's impassable. Maybe like a ruptured Baker cyst or something. Yeah, very good. So what does that mean, a Baker cyst? Anybody know what it is? Good. It's an outpouching of the synovium of the joint. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys are excellent. So the, um, the synovium of the joint kind of outpouches and gets in that popliteal area. The patient's got popliteal pain, some swelling back there. And you look at this thing right away, and you want to make sure it's not a aneurysm. Good. So uh, the way I do that is I put a little flow on there, make sure I don't see like this aneurysmal structure back there. That's one of the things I think about in addition to the DVT and cellulitis. Yes, OK, fine. OK, how about this one? Um, this one's kind of interesting. Who's uh, who wants to take a crack at this? Wes, you look like you're so awake and ready right now. Yes, sir. Um, yes. What do you think? So tell me which leg is this? Tell me which vasculature this is and what do you think it's positive or negative? It looks like that is the, uh, the patient's left femoral. Correct. Um, area and it looks like it looks like it's <laughs> Yeah, like this area right here. See how this is not compressed? This part down here compresses, but then this part right here does not compress. So technically speaking, I mean, this is a, this is a positive study, okay? So it's a positive um, femoral vein there on the left. It's not fully obstructive, so it's a partially occlusive thrombus in the left femoral. It could absolutely be an old clot, yep. Well, peripheral vascular diseases really are on the arterial side of things, and so um, it doesn't throw off the study um, from the venous standpoint. You know, um, I mean, they're going to have um, a lot of you know stenosis and stuff, and narrowing of their arterial side um, with peripheral vascular uh, disease. But the but the veins are still uh, easily compressible. Uh, would I treat this? That is a great question, and I'd have to get more history about the patient. And it turns out with this particular patient, we got some more history, and they were already on Coumadin. And their, their INR was therapeutic. And so in that case, uh, I wouldn't have to answer your question. Um, <laughs> so if this patient came in and they were not being treated, and I saw this, um, I think, uh, and I had no prior history of this being like a chronic DVT, to really say that a patient, if the patient has a history of DVT, to say that they have a new DVT, and this isn't a chronic DVT, there's only one way. And that's an interval ultrasound that shows full resolution of the prior DVT. And people say you've got to be on Coumadin for at least six months for that to happen, um, or you need to have um, uh, thrombolectomy. Um, it's confusing. If this patient was never on um, any anticoagulants and I saw this, I would treat this. Yeah. So it's like, what do you do with that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> clinical conundrum, for sure, because to put them back on the anticoagulants, I mean, the anticoagulants have gigantic risks with them. And uh, I really hate to, it's not, you know, just like putting someone on aspirin, but really, you know, anticoagulating them to treat this. And that's, um, that's, you got, that's a real life, lifestyle um, killer right there. So, um, yeah, I think uh, this, this would be likely in consultation um, with somebody. But most likely, I would treat that. All right, um, Dina. 
What do you think? Hello. Um, hmm. It looks like you're looking at the top of the saucer. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so why don't we see the vein right now? You're compressing too hard. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Dina. She's like, I just took this course three months ago. Uh, so, so, when you're in the pop, that's what I mean. You've got to be bouncing around back there because you may already be pushing too hard. It's pretty easy. It's such a floppy vein. It's easy to have already be compressing it. Excellent. All right, Mervis. Mervalicious. Like that. It looks like the femoral region. Correct. Right femoral. Right fem. And the area looks uh, compressible, but it looks like a lymph node is going to come up right there. Very good, yes. Here's that lymph node up there. Excellent. So if you've got a patient, this is easily, this is nice, kind of hard to visualize. Down here, once in a while we see a good, a good closure there, but I'll tell you what, you got a patient comes with like leg swelling, it's kind of red, and you're going back and forth, maybe it's cellulitis, maybe it's DVT, and you're on the fence, and you see good compressibility there, and you see this, this kidney, what looks like a kidney, a miniature kidney up here, that's what lymph nodes look like. You see a little miniature kidney sitting here in that inguinal area. You can actually put some power flow on there, drop down your PRF in the 800s, 600s, and you will see good flow throughout that whole lymph node. They're very vascular structures. So, um, Where if that was a DVT, it wouldn't have flow? Is that what you're saying? Well, when I first saw a lymph node, I was in my fellowship, Christ Hospital, ran downstairs to a radiologist, this guy named Dr. Sokin, really cool guy. And I said, hey, this guy's got a cool DVT. And he was very nice how he explained to me that that's not a DVT, that's a lymph node. I will always remember him and respect him for that, his, his gentleness with me. But um, I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you, uh, it. And you go, well, maybe that's the SAF up there, you know, something coming in. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's in that, uh, that superficial tissue there. Uh, you can see it's not in the, deep, the deeper so tissues. Yes. So I already forgot your question. I'm just, I got <laughs> sidetracked. It's a large DVT. I really appreciate your <laughs> yeah. story. Yeah, I'll, tell, I'll just keep telling stories to, uh, to distract you from the question. Likely not um, light up. <laughs> it's just <laughs> so... So, so your question is, what would it look like if you put flow on it? It would light up. It would be, it would be hyper. You put flow on it, and there was flow going to it. Does that say this is not a DVT? It's not a DVT. There is flow going to it. If I see flow going down here or up here? Up there. And you're like, is that a DVT? There is flow. Like, no, that's definitely not a DVT. Um, okay, so can I put <laughs> flow on this to tell if that's a DVT or not? Once again, the... I would caution you to use any of that flow stuff to say somebody's a DVT or not because all that literature is so bad for that. Um, the, the, the color parameters that you use for the color augmentation and the respiratory variation are way higher PRFs than we're using, it's much lower sensitivity. Here you have to turn the sensitivity of the Doppler way up to see any flow in there. So it's like you can't even compare the two. That probably answer your question, but that's how I would use it. Dr. Schultz, you're asking me if I have an example of a lymph node that's got nice flow to it. Not in this talk. I'm trying to be sure this isn't uh, um, a DVT. You say it looks like a lymph node. Um, I, maybe if I see a thousand of these, I'd recognize it. But yeah, I could see how I think, I think it's a non-compressible That's the first thing I thought when I saw that first time. Yeah, you basically identify the vasculature down here as separate from this lymph node. See, the vasculature is down here, femoral artery, common femoral vein. That's what I'm saying, yes. So you rule that out by simply seeing the vessels. Seeing the vessels beneath it, yep. And putting it into the clinical context that, hey, this guy's got a red swollen leg. This really, I would expect to see a, a lymph node there. Yeah, you have to go back and examine it. It's, it's in the hands of the clinician. That, I know, when all else fails, you have to be with the labs and the x rays, then you've got to go Got to go look at the patient once in a while. I know. Sometimes I get sucked into it. Okay, now, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Austin. Yeah, so this looks like, um, what leg? Probably the um, left leg. 
What do you guys think? I would say incorrect. It's the right leg. Because, why do I say that? Because this is the artery right here, the femoral. This is a little old lady. She's got a little tiny femoral system. Our depth is too deep. I would decrease our depth. But that's the femoral artery right there. This is the femoral vein, common femoral vein. What's the one on the right that was just being This thing right here? No, it's the Where, down here? There's, uh, this is an arterial structure down here that's being compressed so hard, I think, that we're starting to see some compression of the arterial system. But what do you think this is right here, this common femoral vein? Part of this thing that's collapsing here is a little bit of this femoral vein that's collapsing a little bit in here, too. Yeah, you see it's a lot. I mean, can you guys see how this is a clot? I picked ones that were really hard. They're, they're, most of these are super obvious. But I wanted to pick some ones that were the ones that I struggled with so that you could kind of get a feeling for the, the other uh, end of the spectrum there. So that's basically it. You start in the fem, you go down about five centimeters, and you go to the pop, you go down five centimeters, and it's the grayscale compressibility. Now, the way I do it is I go down until I don't see it anymore, because it only takes me another 10 seconds or so of marching until I get maybe halfway down the leg, and it gives me a little bit more practice with it and some teaching and stuff like that. So. I go down until maybe about halfway down the leg until I don't see it anymore. If I keep seeing it, sometimes I go right through that superficial femoral canal, if I, in that, that adductor canal, if I keep seeing it. But usually I don't. 90% of the time I lose it somewhere halfway down the leg, and then I go to the pop, and then I go to the other leg. And so, but technically speaking, it's that five centimeter uh, distance up there. Any questions about that stuff? Other questions?